In the last lecture, we looked at an episode of moral heroism from Roman history, painted by Benjamin West, an American working in London. Today, it's going to be a painting by John Trumbull, another American, who followed in West's tracks to London, where he painted an incident from recent American history. It's become one of the icons of the American Revolution. We've all seen it in endless versions on postage stamps and prints and souvenirs and in our grade school textbooks. The actual picture hangs here in the gallery, and considering its fame, it's surprisingly small. It's only about 30 inches wide. Let's examine it on the screen uh, for just a bit and make mental notes uh, of the things in the picture that strike us. We see a powerful overall design. Great diagonal stripes rising from the lower right to the upper left. There's a kind of cresting wave of red beneath a rising mass of clouds and a bright stripe of blue sky. We get it right away. If we knew nothing else, we'd know it was an uphill assault by the soldiers in red. But it seems to have paused for just a moment, and in a pool of light, a man in blue with a lace shirt is down, and a man in bare feet is fending off a bayonet. Behind him, a third man with a musket leans back, and just behind him is a group of men with flags also leaning away. At the very far right, two men pause in the act of leaving the scene and look back with concern on their faces. This picture has a special importance to the Yale Gallery. It has the lowest accession number in a museum that now has more than 100,000 of them. It's number 1832.1. Trumbull donated 30 pictures to Yale in exchange for an annuity of $1,000. And he lived on for another 11 years, seeing to the care of the collection and receiving visitors. Here you see part of the Trumbull collection uh, today installed last year by Helen Cooper, the leading specialist, by the way, in Trumbull's paintings, from whom I've learned a lot, hanging in the wonderful Civil War era street hall. In 1832, the first Trumbull gallery, however, was a simpler affair on the old campus. Here you see it, a little neoclassical building designed by Trumbull himself with advice from the local architect Ithiel Town with two picture galleries upstairs, and in the basement, a burial place for Trumbull and his wife. The gallery stood there until 1905, after a bigger gallery had been built, and the collection, and this plaque to Trumbull, and the Trumbulls themselves, were moved. <laughs> to explain the action in the picture here, uh, we can turn to the artist himself. John Trumbull wrote a description of the picture for the catalog that he published after the works came to Yale. Now, he assumed that his readers in 1832 would know that the Battle of Bunker Hill was part of the siege of Boston in 1775, when the British Army and Navy had occupied Boston, but were surrounded and besieged by rebellious American colonists who were increasingly belligerent. Trouble started that spring, when a detachment of British soldiers marched out of, to Lexington and tried to seize the munitions that the locals had been stashing there. But the Redcoats were pushed back. Now I'm quoting John Trumbull. Hostilities commenced at Lexington on the 19th of April, 1775. On the first news of this affair, the youth and yeomanry of New England hurried to Boston en masse with such arms as they could command. And the British troops were shut up in the town by a numerous assemblage of enthusiastic men, brave but undisciplined, badly armed, ill-supplied with ammunition, 
destitute of military uniforms or equipments. Cartridges and cartridge, cartridge boxes were rare, bayonets almost unknown, and a great proportion of those heroic men possessed only fouling pieces with some powder in their horns and a few bullets in their pockets. Military science was I as imperfect among the officers in high in command as was discipline among the inferior officers and troops. Yet, such was the zeal of the moment that the determination was taken to advance from Cambridge and to establish a post on Breed's Hill, the nearest point of approach to Boston, little more distant than half a mile from the north part of the town. And on the evening of the 16th of June, a detachment of 12 or 1,500 men, commanded by General Putnam and General Colonel, uh, Colonel Prescott, marched for this purpose. Arrived at the spot selected at 10 o'clock and commenced throwing up a small redoubt. The British had no knowledge of this movement until daylight exposed in their view the progress which had been made from the moment of this discovery. They opened a heavy fire from ships and batteries which was continued incessantly through the day until the attack on the works was made in the afternoon by the British troops uh, under General Howe. Thus, from 10 o'clock in the evening until 4 o'clock in the morning, six hours was all the time which this gallant detachment had to prosecute their work, fortifying the hill without interruption. They were not relieved in the morning, but remained all day under the fire of the enemy laboring to complete their work, which they ultimately defended under the immediate orders of the gallant veteran Prescott with the most unyielding bravery and quitted their post only when their ammunition was entirely expended. Joseph Warren, the rights of his country. At this time, he was a very influential member of the Provincial Congress, assembled at Watertown, near Cambridge, <coughs> and a few days preceding the battle, had been elected a major general but at, has yet <coughs> had uh, assumed no command. He was going out to dine when the increasing din of the action impelled him to gallop to the scene where he arrived almost at the moment of defeat. This is the moment chosen for the painting when the death of General Warren and the obstinate resistance of men almost unarmed to well-armed and disciplined troops is meant to be shown. When the Americans Having expended their ammunition, the British troops became completely successful and master of the field. At this last moment of action, General Warren was killed by a musket ball through the head. The principal group represents him expiring. A soldier on his knees supports him and with one hand wards off the bayonet of a British grenadier who, in the heat and fury natural at such a moment, aims to revenge the death of a favorite officer, Colonel Abercrombie, who had just fallen at his feet. Colonel Small, who had been intimately connected with General Warren, saw him fall and flew to save him. He's represented seizing the musket of the grenadier to prevent the fatal blow and speaking to his friend. It was too late. The general had barely life remaining to recognize the voice of friendship. He had lost the power of speech and expired with a smile of mingled gratitude and triumph. Near him, several Americans whose ammunition is expended, although destitute of bayonets, are seized to persist in a resistance obstinate and desperate, but fruitless. Near this side of the painting is seen General Putnam, reluctantly ordering the retreat of these brave men, while behind him, a party of American troops expose or resist to their last fire the victorious column of the enemy. Behind Colonel Small is seen Colonel Pitcairn of the British Marines, mortally wounded and falling in the arms of his son, to whom he was speaking at the fatal moment. And under the feet of Colonel Small lies the dead body of Colonel Abercrombie, General Howe, who commanded the British troops, and General Clinton, seen behind the principal group, (coughs) 
On the right of the painting, a young American, wounded in the sword hand and in the breast, has begun to retire, attended by a faithful Negro. But seeing his general fall, he hesitates whether to save himself or, wounded as he is, to return and assist in saving Warren, a life more precious to his country than his own. Behind this group are seen the British column ascending the hill. Grenadiers, headed by an officer bearing the British colors, mounting the feeble entrenchments, and more distant, the Somerset ship of war, which lay during the action between Boston and Charlestown. The north end of Boston, with the battery on Copps Hill, and the harbor, shipping, etc., etc. No part of the town of Charlestown is seen, but the dark smoke indicates the conflagration. The artist was, on that day, adjutant of the 1st Regiment of Connecticut troops stationed at Roxbury and saw the action from that point. Well, Trumbull saw the action from Roxbury, which was four and a half miles away, so he couldn't have seen a single one of the details that he had describes and pictures so vividly. We'll come back in a few minutes for another look at how he painted a battle that he didn't see. But first, let me take a few minutes to sketch something about John Trumbull for you and the great project that this picture is part of. John Trumbull was born in this house in Lebanon, Connecticut, a small town up between Norwich and Hartford. His father, Jonathan, on the right, was a representative to the General Assembly of Connecticut, and later he was governor. The artist was born into the merchant gentry, in other words, a rare thing for an American artist. After going to a very good local school, he proceeded at the age of 15 to Harvard, as his father had done, and he became the first American artist to go to college. He was already smitten with drawing, and in Boston he saw not only illustrated books and prints reproducing old master paintings, but he also encountered the first real artist he'd ever seen, John Singleton Copley. Later on, Trumbull wrote that he was dazzled by Copley's ease in society and by his maroon coat and gilt buttons. <laughs> and he got to see portraits that Copley was painting of the most prominent people in New England, like the great merchant Isaac Winslow and his lavishly dressed wife, Jemima Dubuque. Trumbull said that these were the first paintings he'd seen that were worthy of the name. The painter, Copley, uh, was soon to leave Boston for London uh, and a successful career there, and that was going to provide a template for Trumbull later on. There were pictures at Harvard, and of course there were books. Uh, a scholar who studied the checkout sheets in the Harvard Library discovered that Trumbull borrowed not only books of literature and history, but also books on art, how to do it books, among others, uh, Hogarth's uh, treatise uh, here on screen, and also uh, a manual of facial expression by Charles Le Brun at the bottom. Trumbull graduated in 1773, the year of the Boston Tea Party when animosity towards the British was growing. Returning home to Lebanon, he formed a little militia company of his own, and in 1775, with armed rebellion brewing, he was made an adjutant in the 1st Regiment of Connecticut. Now, it didn't hurt that his father was the governor of the state. You heard him say that his unit was camped in Roxbury, uh, on the outskirts of Boston and overlooking the city, which was occupied by a great many British soldiers, and that he watched the Battle of Bunker Hill, which was so far away that he had to use binoculars. This was the closest that Trumbull was ever going to get to any battle in his life. The next month, when General Washington arrived to take charge, Trumbull did him the service of drawing a map uh, showing the enemy's position here on the screen. Washington made him his second aide-de-camp. It's not recorded that Trumbull did anything else of importance for Washington, but for the rest of his life, he proudly carried the distinction of having served the general. He was still only 20 years old. He next got appointed by General Gates, the commander of the Northern Armies, as deputy adjutant general at the rank of colonel. He was posted to Ticonderoga, the stronghold that was freshly captured from the French at the foot of Lake Champlain, and put to work 
planning for the strengthening of the fortifications, which he did. And this is his plan here on the lower right. Trumbull was offended, though, that his official commission hadn't come through Congress. And when his papers finally did arrive, they were dated four months later than the time he'd actually begun work. He wrote a huffy letter about this to John Hancock, the president of the Congress. And then when he didn't get what he wanted, he resigned from the army. You could do that then. <laughs> so at the age of 21, that was it. Colonel Trumbull went home in 1777, and that's all he ever saw of the revolution. He had a proud and touchy personality. He went back to Boston and for a couple of years made a living working in his brother's import-export business. And on the side, he was copying the copies uh, that John Smybert had made in Europe of various old masters and trying his hand at scenes uh, from Roman history like this one with the help of various prints. Uh, one of them was an engraved reproduction of a picture by Salvator Rosa showing the plight of Belisarius, a Roman commander who, according to his legend, fell from favor from the Emperor Justinian, was blinded, and was reduced to begging. Now, Trumbull took the print, as you see, and expanded it with a kind of outdoor stage setting uh, for an untrained artist, pretty competent. It's been observed that Trumbull, who felt himself victimized when he was a soldier by an undress, young, undress Congress, uh, would have seen this subject autobiographically. He also got a hold of this engraving uh, of a picture by Gavin Hamilton, a scene of noble Roman suicide and oath-taking, and he adapted it. The painting, as you know, is in the British Art Center, and it was the subject of an earlier lecture in this series. In the painting, uh, Trumbull made changes that took the crude energy out of Hamilton's scene. Uh, the layout is more suave and spacious, it's true, and his but his Brutus is not a <coughs> ferocious muscle man, uh, but instead an elegant youth who sort of sashays away from his dying mother, a sister rather, uh, rolling his eyes to heaven. That year, uh, Trumbull made a portrait of himself. It advertises his ideas about himself. He's leaning forward and looking at us with a wide-eyed kind of candor. He's included brushes, and a palette with paint laid out systematically and prop them up on a book, suggesting that art depends on knowledge and that he's got it. The spine is stamped Hogarth, so we'll realize that he's studied Hogarth's famous treatise that you saw on the analysis of beauty. This is an image of ambition and availability. Trumbull's big career move came in 1870 1780, I should say, when he went to Lond London to study under Benjamin West, who we heard last time was the most important man in the English-speaking art world, the co-founder of the Royal Academy and so-called historical painter to the king. West had emigrated from Pennsylvania almost 20 years earlier, and his success was a beacon for other Americans wanting to make careers, including Copley of Boston, Gilbert Stuart of Providence, Trumbull didn't leave the colonies for England because he was a loyalist, a political uh, conservative, far, far from it. The war had been going on for four years and Trumbull remained vocally loyal uh, to the American cause, writing sword-rattling letters to his family members back home until he was charged with treason and slapped into prison. If you had to do time in London, a Bridwell prison was where you wanted to be relatively lenient lockup for better born or less uh, heinous criminals. Trumbull was able to rent a room from the warden and get his meals sent over from the local pub. <laughs> he was also permitted to read and work and have visits uh, from his friend Stuart. And together, actually, they painted this portrait of the prisoner Trumbull. And Trumbull made this skillful copy of a Correggio while he was behind bars or behind curtains. Actually, it was copying another copy, uh, one that Benjamin West had made while he was traveling in Italy. Anyway, Trumbull had connections among British politicians who were pro-American, and after nearly eight years, eight, eight months rather, he was out on bail, half of it put up by West and Stewart. He went home to small town Connecticut, 
but soon found it confining and crude after Paris and London. And how, in fact, could he forget the possibilities that London offered, where there was an art world and wealthy people who bought pictures, and a royal academy patronized by the king himself. This is what you see in the painting by Zoffany. So in 1784, he was back in London, in West's studio, where he worked all day at drawing and painting, and at night went to classes at the Royal Academy. He was introduced into West's wide circle of high-born and accomplished, accomplished Englishmen, but he was restless, and he wrote, wrote to his brother about his doubts. He wrote, whether it is that I grow old, he was 28, uh, grow old, and at the edge of curiosity is worn down, I, I know not, but I often wish myself seated in Lebanon. I hope to return to America as soon as I can, as soon as I can complete myself in my profession, but I must see Italy first. The late War of Independence offers a new and noble field for historical painting, and our vanity will make portraiture as gainful in America as in any part of the world. The following year, his ideas about historical painting had ripened. He said, the great object of my wishes is to take up the history of our country and paint the principal events, particularly of the late war. But this is a work which, will, which to execute with an, a degree of honor or profit will require very great powers, and those powers must be attained before I leave Europe. Well, to attain those powers, West's studio was the best place in the world. There he had the benefit not only of West's ideas, but also Copley's, and he could work alongside his more experienced friend, Gilbert Stuart. And West did have powerful ideas. Fourteen years earlier, in 1771, West had exhibited the death of General Wolfe, a picture that Joshua Reynolds predicted would cause a revolution. Wolfe uh, was a young English general who was killed just as his forces were winning the Battle of Quebec and gaining uh, for England a vast territory as a result. The revolutionary part was that the, uh, the event shown in the painting was so recent, it was just 12 years before, and that the participants were shown wearing their own clothes, not some idealized historical costume, which was the expected thing. West felt that Wolfe's self-sacrifice for the king and the nation was so obviously noble that he could ignore the dress code. A, a lot of West's staging was made up. Wolfe had actually died in the woods, and there were only a few people actually present. But here we're dealing with a kind of historical fiction, uh, and Trumbull learned its lessons. Just as Stendhal or Tolstoy mixes documented events and real people with in invented ones, or a filmmaker like uh, Spielberg or Catherine Bigelow does the same, so does a painter when he tries to recreate a battle. None of, them, none of them are obliged to be accurate, just plausible. They need to choose vivid incidents that put across the spirit of what was going on, because the painter's job is to tell a story in a single frame, so it needs to be visu visually legible. It's always been this way. In the 2,500 years of battle scenes we've got, not many of them were made by artists who were actually there. Most of them follow a few formulas, the oldest one uh, being to imagine rival generals meeting and fighting on the battlefield, usually at the decisive moment, embodying the whole war in a single combat. That's what Paolo Uccello did in one of the paintings of the Battle of San Romano, brought, uh, fought uh, during the painter's own lifetime, where the Florentine general charges a Sienese rival and unhorses him. When Altdorfer uh, painted the Battle of Issus uh, in 333 BC, he makes Alexander the Great charge at the Persian emperor Darius and chase him off the bat battlefield. In these cases, the battles actually happened. We know who won. It's the visualization that's entirely fanciful. Trumbull had watched his friend Copley uh, paint a contemporary scene the death of the popular prime minister, the Earl of Chatham, better known as William Pitt the Elder before he became a lord. Uh, Chatham advocated fundamental liberties for the American colonies, 
uh, recognition of Congress, no taxation without representation, and so on. And he warned that the Americans would not be conquered. After he'd given a fiery speech uh, in the House of Lords, uh, Chatham collapsed. And you see that here in the picture, died a month later. Copley managed something very difficult to invent an image of a scene that he hadn't witnessed, including 55 portraits of people who were there, and still put across the pathos of the moment, not just by the way he shows the stricken man with a pale face and raised eyes, but also the visual drama of this long upward sweep of his robe lining, like a shroud almost, that continues up by the gesture of the man reaching up behind. Trumbull took note of these devices and, as he imagined, scenes from the American War of Independence. He was able to paint these scenes because West paved the way for him and then stood aside for him. In, in 1783, West himself was planning a series of scenes from the Revolutionary War and engraved reproductions of them, but for various reasons he dropped out and encouraged Trumbull to take on the project instead. So in 1785, Trumbull was thinking seriously about painting the deaths of General Warren at Bunker Hill and of Montgomery at Quebec. And in 1786, he finished both pictures. You've seen uh, the Battle uh, of Bunker Hill uh, already for a moment. Its companion piece is just as impressive. It shows the attack on Quebec led by General Richard Montgomery on Christmas Eve in 1775. This was another losing effort in the Revolutionary War that produced another dead hero, whose example seemed to Trumbull uh, just as inspiring as General Warren's. Trumbull wasn't actually at Quebec, uh, naturally. Working seven, 11 years later in London, he had to rely on sketchy information. He did have portraits of the main characters, and he'd heard the story of how Montgomery and his battalion had tried a surprise attack under the cover, cover of a blizzard. They planned to take the British blockhouse below the cliffs, but were detected and a single cannon blast killed Montgomery and two others. Now, Trumbull had to make up most of what we see, but he had perfect models for his composition right there in London, pictures you've just seen, because the whole idea of Trumbull's uh, picture here comes from the one of West above, which shows the same bleak locale, Quebec, and an earlier battle when the British had won the city from the French, but at the expense of their commander's life. So Trumbull takes West's idea and he adds a whole new animation and excitement uh, here from the reactions of those soldiers in their fur hats at the left, from the sharp, sharp uh, raking light, and from the blowing smoke and blasted tree and twisting flags. And he amps up the pathos by putting Montgomery on his knees bending back in pain and binding him with his brother, brother officers in a kind of complex of fluid curves. For the tremendous rising diagonal of the figures, he also had the example of Copley's death of Chatham on the right. And of course, he'd used a similar device in his own painting of Bunker Hill. Well, that year, 1786, Trumbull met the American minister in Paris, Thomas Jefferson who encouraged him and suggested that he come to Paris and stay with him at his grand rented house on the Champs-Élysées. Having finished both pictures, uh, Trumbull took him with him to Paris, and he stayed with Jefferson for a month. Jefferson wrote to his friend, the President, President Ezra Stiles of Yale, Trumbull has paid us a visit here and brought with him two pictures which are the admiration of the connoisseurs. His natural talents for this art seem almost unparalleled. Trumbull met the leading artists of the day. He went sightseeing with the great sculptor Udon. He met the 23-year-old American architect uh, Charles Bullfinch, the future architect of the Capitol in Washington. And he met Jacques-Louis David, the most important uh, painter in France. Jefferson coached him <coughs> on the composition of his painting of the Declaration uh, of Independence. Both these pictures that made the trip 
to Paris uh, with Trumbull. Both of them made it because they're small. They are finished sketches, modelli in the traditional European practice, painted on spec to guide him later when he hopefully got a commission for large versions and to guide printmakers when they made reproductions. Trumbull went to Germany uh, in search of the best engraver to copy these pictures and to print them in large quantities for sale back in America. The profit motive was very real for Trumbull and for other history painters at the time. <coughs> the several engra engravings that reproduced uh, the picture made the image known to a vastly bigger audience than would ever see the painting itself. We'll come back to these and the other paintings in the series in a few minutes. In the following year in London, Trumbull painted a battlefield scene calculated to appeal uh, to a British audience uh, on the right, since it shows the English winning. Like his Bunker Hill painting, it displays the gallantry of an en enemy officer and the generosity of a victorious general. The British in their garrison on Gibraltar were under long siege in 1786 by Spanish and French forces. They made a daring sortie outside their fort and caused terrific destruction. Trumbull based his picture on a report uh, from a man who wasn't there, by the way, either, um, in which one of the Spanish officers, Don Jose de Barbosa, had been left behind by his retreating troops and turned by himself and charged the s British soldiers single-handed. After he was mortally wounded, the general, George Eliot, offered to help him. But the Spanish, uh, <coughs> the Spanish uh, Don Jose refused. You can read the exchange from their gestures quite easily. The reliability of the story is doubtful, but the it certainly fits the English romantic cliches of Spanish pride, and it's colorful enough for the curtain scene of an opera. The picture came with a bonus. The fierce dying warrior John, Don Jose got a pose that most people would recognize at the time of a famous dying barbarian, um, a Hellenistic Greek statue that was on the short list of great statues for educated artists to see and copy. By the summer of 1786, uh, Trumbull, who was still in London, had started a third of his scenes from the Revolution. Another battle, another death of a general, this one Hugh Mercer, uh, that Trumbull again reconstructed on the report of eyewitnesses. This one was a victory for the American side, but at a cost that's pretty obvious uh, in the picture by the ground littered with bodies. Mercer and his brigade had been surprised by a detachment of British. We can still pick out uh, the doomed Mercer right away uh, at the intersection of those many diagonals crisscrossing in the center, brandishing his sword, having been bayoneted repeatedly, uh, the reports went. Uh, but he wouldn't ask for mercy, and he didn't die until nine year, days later. Only a few British were killed and wounded, uh, as you can see, a few. Uh, so at this point, it looks like the battle is lost, except that the cavalry is arriving, in a manner of speaking, uh, in the person, unmistakable person of General Washington, who's spurred himself to the scene and is about to turn around the battle by rousing the Continental troops. Before the Battle of Princeton, there had been another major action under Washington, the brilliant capture of Trenton a week earlier. This is why Washington and his troops crossed the Delaware on a stormy, cold Christmas night to surprise the German mercenaries in the morning. In just 45 minutes, they took the town of Trenton and a 1,000 Hessian prison, uh, prisoners, including the commandant, uh, General uh, Colonel Rawl, uh, who was wounded in the fighting. Trumbull decided not to show the attack itself, but instead the aftermath. Here, uh, Washington is ordering one of his colonels to care for the commander, the German enemy commander. So Trumbull picked an incident that would display Washington's good-heartedness towards the defeated enemy. Later on, Trumbull would write, I composed the picture for the express purpose of giving to all living and future soldiers in the service of their country to show mercy and kindness to a fallen enemy, their enemy no longer, when wounded and in their power. Trumbull tracked down the participants, sketched their portraits, some of them here at Yale, 
sticking them into the picture, uh, one after the other for another 40 years or so, he genuinely wanted to create a true permanent record, and not incidentally to sell more prints. You can see that uh, compared to his first two exciting paintings of Bunker Hill in Montreal and, and uh, uh, Montgomery at Quebec. In the later scenes, uh, this series looked pretty static and self-consciously staged. Here are the last four in Trumbull's project. Uh, the saga of his 40 years of labor in getting them painted and into places where they could be displayed and having them reproduced in prints is another story, a long story. Their artistic interest falls off pretty sharply, uh, but they are revealing for the history lessons, lessons they try to teach. Trumbull chooses the sacred scene of the Declaration of Independence uh, to demonstrate American solidarity and other scenes of gentlemanly surrender and gracious reconciliation that would lead to nation building. I'll simply remind you that some of Trumbull's large versions, very large, uh, can be seen in high places, including the rotunda of the capital of Washington. Trumbull showed his small version to the House of Representatives in 1817, and that got him a commission to paint this huge version and three more. And before he brought it to Washington, he took it on tour uh, to Philadelphia and Boston and Baltimore, where many thousands of people paid to see it and paid more for an engraved reproduction. Let's now turn to the Battle of Bunker Hill again and look at Trumbull's step-by-step -step process of composing it. Luckily, there are enough drawings preserved so that we can actually see how those ideas uh, developed. The earliest of the drawings is in chalk on a great big sheet of paper. He first visualized the composition in mirror image from the way it ended up, but most of the essentials are there already. The upward sweep of British soldiers, General Warren on the ground, and grenadiers aiming bayonets at him, which a soldier actually tries to ward off. The composition bracketed at both sides by a wounded man uh, at the right side and a group at the left. Behind Trumbull's layout is again the great example of West's composition for the death of Wolf on top. I showed you that Trumbull based his death of Montgomery at the lower left uh, on West, and I think he did the same with Bunker Hill, keeping the upward sweep, expanding it, moving the climax off center, adding more action, and multiplying actors. In the next drawing, um, he elaborates the scheme. Uh, in this small, detailed pen drawing, the soldiers on the left are colonists moving away, beginning the retreat that's been ordered by General Israel Putnam. Whom you see way at the right, waving his sword. Warren lies helpless, and several grenadiers are about to use their bayonets on him. Behind them, uh, the line of colonials is actually moving forward, though they lack powder as well as bayonets. This drawing makes it clear uh, that Trumbull was thinking about another important battle picture of a few years earlier that he'd seen in London, one by his friend Copley. Uh, this is the death of Major Pearson. And as Jules Prown pointed out some years ago, it shows another young commander cut down at the point of victory, in this case, on the Channel Island of Jersey, where the British repelled an invasion by the French at the cost uh, of Major Person. This is a good moment to remind you all of Jules Prown's fundamental writing uh, on history painting by Copley and Trumbull and West. Um, and some of this is in your suggested readings and it's very much worthwhile. Copley painted uh, this picture in London while Trumbull was also working there, so Trumbull surely saw it on the easel and discussed it with his older American friend. It's got a similar sort of shallow horizontal layout, bold stripes of dark and light, retreating figures, turbulent action with flags and smoke, and lots of specific details related. The next drawing shows that Trumbull has flipped his composition and mirror image, and that's the arrangement that he sticks with. He makes a lot of refinements, but the important new thing uh, here is that we see Colonel Small stride forward, 
and take a hold of the grenadier's musket to spare the dying General Warren. Next, a mus much less finished drawing. You see Warren's legs uh, here outlined at the left, just below a sort of pattern of squaring that he planned to use to transfer the composition, but didn't. He has new ideas for the foreground figures. At the left is a corpse on the ground. And at the right, two soldiers retreating. And then in the middle, he uses the chalk to draw a nude figure, either from a nude uh, live model or more likely, I think, from a plaster cast uh, of a statue. That statue was famous in Trumbull's time. And he surely knew it, despite never having made the trip to Rome that he'd hoped for. If he had, he'd have seen this on the Quirinal Hill, the Dioscuri, the Castor and Pollux, the ancient, which are ancient Roman copies, I should say, of Greek originals, the so-called horse tamers, who hold the reins of their fiery horses. There were plaster casts of these figures, and there were also engravings uh, like this one, all over the place in Europe, wherever artists were trained. The, to choose it was kind of brilliant uh, by uh, Trumbull. The classical allusion would, of course, associate this figure uh, in the middle uh, with heroic youth in antiquity. By making a few changes uh, to his arms, but by keeping the positions of, of his legs and torso and turned head, Trumbull could express both the forward motion and the hesitation of his handsome young gentleman. That gentleman was Lieutenant Thomas Grosvenor of Connecticut, who's moving away from the action, responding to the call for a retreat. But he pauses to look back, back towards the death scene of Warren and the storming of the redoubt. Behind him is a black man with a musket, one of two soldiers of African descent who fought at Bunker Hill. These additions to the picture emphasize that the story, as told by Trumbull, is one of shared sacrifice and of unity. He shows Grosvenor, a young man of privilege, who went to war in a feathered hat uh, and a blue jacket with brass buttons, gesturing with his bandaged hand. With his other hand, he uses his expensive ruffled shirt to stanch the blood from his chest wound. And the wounded man on the ground beneath him also has the clothes of a gentleman. While over on the left, in very strong contrast, is Grosvenor's working class counterpart, a man in ragged costume, bare feet, lying dead or dying. And lying next to him is his musket and the spade that he'd used all night to dig trenches. Behind the fortifications are more details that speak. A colonial soldier sitting, dead or dying. Behind him, a British officer who's actually managed to get into the redoubt is stabbing an American um, kind of backhand while gripping the American by the wrist. And further back, a couple of men in farmer's hats blaze away with the last of their powder. And General Putnam at the left, seeing that the position is lost, raises his sword and commands a retreat. The body language of the group of Americans at the apex here makes that retreat look inevitable. They lean away from the surging wave of redcoats as they look at it with a mix of fear and defiance. There are men of all ages and classes here. There's the second a black man you can just see here. And there's a clergyman, this one. Men of all classes, tightly pressed together, making it unmistakable that they're all in this together. Trumbull asks, adds uh, details to emphasize the heavy British casualties. Enlisted men are dying on the hill here, and several officers are mortally wounded. This is the corpse of Colonel Abercrombie, which the other sto soldiers step over. 
a little beam of light uh, falls on Pitcairn, who falls back into the arms of two men, one of them his son. In another stripe of light is the man whose death Warren, uh, Warren's <coughs> whose uh, death Trumbull chose to single out as an example of valor. Joseph Warren was a phenomenally versatile young man. He just turned 34 when he was killed. He had a reputation as the best surgeon in Boston. He became a prime spokesman for the Liberty Faction in Massachusetts and one of the leaders of the Patriots, together with Samuel Adams and John Hancock. He was a well-known speechmaker, and after the Boston Massacre, he's the one who urged New Englanders to resist the British, be ready for war, and it's he who sent Paul Revere on his ride in April 1775 to warn the country people about the British forces advancing towards Lexington and Concord. As the crisis developed that spring, Warren was made president pro tem of the Provincial Congress and put in charge of organizing the siege of Boston. Three days before Bunker Hill, he was elected major general. But since his commission hadn't come through yet, he went to General Putnam and volunteered as a private. That became part of Warren's legend. You, you see him pictured in an illustration of almost a century later. Putnam offered him command of the army, but Warren said no. And he went into battle as an equal with farmers and merchants. And it's reported that he cheered, cheered them on. He was one of the last to retreat when he was killed by a shot to the head. The pathos here comes not only from Warren's death at the age of 34, but also from his life. He was one of the most gifted and passionate American leaders. He had everything to live for. He didn't have to be there at all that day. For Trumbull, Warren's sacrifice could serve as an example for the succeeding generation of American youth. One of the stories about Warren's death you heard at the beginning, told by Trumbull himself, about the British grenadier who saw one of his favorite officers fall to the ground and in revenge uh, tried to bayonet the helpless General Warren, but was restrained not just by an American soldier, but also by Colonel Small, a British officer who knew Warren. In Trumbull's words, Small saw Warren fall. This is a quote, saw Warren fall and flew to save him. He's represented seizing the musket of the grenadier to prevent the fatal blow and speaking to his friend. It was too late. The general had barely life remaining and expired with a smile of mingled gratitude and triumph. Well, this incident of the enlisted man's fury being thwarted by the officer's gallantry amounts to a little allegory. You could call it compassion overcoming revenge. Um, it struck me as such a conveniently neat statement about social class that I wondered if it had actually happened. Um, to try to find out, I made an expedition into the literature on the Battle of Bunker Hill, uh, going back uh, s several centuries, and I found a tangle of confusion, mistakes, omissions, biases, and more or less constant repetition. In fact, many writers evidently relied on Trumbull's picture as a source of what happened, <laughs> which wasn't very helpful to me. Uh, I won't torment you with all this, but the short version is that Dr. Warren really did go into battle beautifully dressed. He actually was shot during the storming of the redoubt when a re retreat was ordered, and he died instantly. The part with the angry grenadier, though, seems to have been Trumbull's invention. I think we can see how and why he invented it. Uh, Colonel Small, the officer intervening, uh, was well known socially to Dr. Warren and to General Putnam and other leading Boston revolutionaries. He and Warren were brothers in the same Masonic Lodge. Colonel Small, however, denied doing what Trumbull shows. A letter from a fellow officer written 33 years later quotes Small saying the following, Trumbull paid me the compliment of trying to save the life of Warren, but the fact is that life had fled before I saw his remains. In that same year, another writer reported Small as saying that earlier in the battle, he came close to the redoubt and saw two Americans aim their muskets squarely at him. 
I knew the excellence of their marksmen, he said, and considered myself gone. At that moment, my old friend, General Putnam, rushed forward and striking the muzzles of their pieces up with his sword, cried out, for God's sake, my lads, don't fire at that man. I love him as a brother. He was obeyed. I bowed, thanked him, and walked away unmolested. <laughs> Colonel Small is also quoted as saying that the Americans, as, just as the Americans were retreating, his commander, General Howe, pointed out what he called an elegant young man on the ground. Small recognized him and said it was his friend Warren. General Howe then said to Small, leave me instantly, run. Keep the troops off, save him if possible. I flew to the spot. My dear friend, I said to Warren, I hope you are not badly hurt. He looked up, seemed to recollect me, smiled, and died. Well, these words of Colonel Small uh, that just quoted are in a letter by Trumbull himself that seems to have been <laughs> over overlooked. <laughs> and they help to explain how and why Trumbull would invent an incident of Small preventing an atrocity to the helpless Warren. It actually wasn't much of a stretch, as you heard. Trumbull had at first hand that Putnam had kept his own men from killing his British friend Small. And a little later, Small had tried to go to the aid of Warren. Though Trumbull, I think, took two acts of mercy involving Small and collapsed them into a single incident, invented but plausible and certainly eloquent. It's both a statement about the code of behavior expected of officers and gentlemen, a statement about class, in other words, and about the values of an enlightened civilization. It's good to remember the warning by the historian Lord Snowden that truth is the first casualty of war. <laughs> I need to add to the tale of gallantry supposedly shown by the British towards the dying General Warren that there were other less flattering accounts than Trumbull's, including a report that British soldiers bayoneted Warren's body beyond recognition and stripped it and threw it into a ditch. But what about the ethics of inventing and picturing historic actions, heroic actions too, that didn't happen, but are more inspiring than those that did? <laughs> On that point, Trumbull, by the standards of his time, was absolutely in the clear. When somebody accused Benjamin West of historical inaccuracies, West said, there was no other way of representing the death of a hero but by an epic representation of it. It must exhibit the event in a way to excite awe and veneration, and that which may be required to give superior interest to the representation must be introduced, all that can show the importance of the hero. A mere matter of fact will never produce this effect. Trumbull's purpose was not to document the battle, but to commemorate it and to portray the leading men who fought it. That's not the same thing as painting an exact reconstruction of the final assault and Warren's death. Trumbull couldn't have done that if he'd wanted to. He was miles away. The air was full of smoke. The reports he got later from participants must have differed e even soon afterward. Poetic license was not only allowed, it was expected. Trumbull used that license to assemble various incidents from the colonial's last stand, which were told to him years later, and which probably didn't all happen simultaneously. He added a bit of his own invention, and out of all that he constructed what functions for us like a movie still from a scene of furious action. Trumbull's painting is a terrifically vivid image of a group of colonists, men badly equipped with weapons, but well armed with belief and courage, being driven back by the most powerful army on earth. That army, our, Trumbull makes clear, was led by principled men who are capable of compassionate behavior. The hero of the day was a young doctor who had volunteered to be there who risked everything to contribute something, and who died a good death. Trumbull's audience knew that just nine months after their loss at Bunker Hill, and after they'd made some very adroit moves, the colonial armies were going to surround the British in Boston and drive them out. That was the beginning of the end for British America. It was a long step beyond a mere declaration towards true independence. 
and towards a new society. Next week, we're going to consider another scene of war, as little known as the Bunker Hill by Trumbull is famous. It shows Napoleon's grand army with none of the customary valor or glory or even virtuous self-sacrifice that were the rule in painting armies at work. It asks us to think differently about war. So please come if you can. Thank you.